Hey everyone, so you ever wonder, like in that intro just now, you ever wonder what that little crease pattern down there in the bottom is? Like, uh, why don't we, why don't we take a look at it again? So that crease pattern is actually a Pythagorean stretch, and it's been there the whole time, but I've never really talked about it before. So today in this video and in the next few videos, we're going to be talking about what exactly are Pythagorean stretches, uh, what are they, how do we use them, why are they useful, uh, and all that stuff. So let's just start by talking about like what exactly is a Pythagorean stretch, what, like, what is Pythagorean, what does Pythagoras have to do with anything. So let's start with a water bomb base. So I have this, um, well, I, yeah, just ignore the pre-creases, but basically just take a little scrap paper. We can call it a 2x2 two two grid, right? So it's basically a 2x2 two two grid, and we've got these four corner flaps. That's basically what's going on here from a box splitting perspective. And now, what if I ask you, what's the longest base you can make out of this? So, like, let's say we're making, like, a seahorse or something. Well, the longest distance we have right now is just these two units, right? Diagonally across, or, like, this two units tall, basically. But that actually, we can actually stretch it out a little bit longer. We can make a base that's even longer. And as we know from efficiency, right, we know what efficiency is. Efficiency is the ratio between final model size compared to the initial starting paper. So if we can make our base longer, that would basically increase our efficiency. So a way, one way we can make a longer base is if we stretch it into a fish base. It's not really a great, you know, fluid animation. But it kind of stretches it out. And now, instead of having four one-unit flaps, we have these two short flaps and two long flaps. And uh, we can do the math to figure out exactly how long it is. So if we're calling this one unit long, if originally they were one unit long, then this distance is the square root of two. All right. So the long flaps are the square root of two, so like 1.4 units long. And... What are these small flaps? Well, the whole thing was originally 2, 2 minus square root of 2, so th these small ones are 2 minus square root of 2 long. And so initially we had 4 1 unit flaps, and now we have, you know, square root of 2 unit long flaps. And so, you know, you see it did make our base longer, but the problem is, is that the flaps are now at irrational lengths, right? So instead of having a 1 unit flap, we now have a square root of 2 unit flap. And instead of a uh, one unit flap, we have a two minus square root of two. And also, what is the altitude of this point? Like, what is the axial? Well, this height, this point, is going to be also two minus two root, two minus square root of two units tall. So if we were trying to incorporate this onto a grid, and the rest of the model was on like a regular grid like this, it would be kind of ugly, right? It would not fit in very well. Right, the square root of two unit flaps will not not line up with the you know the actual one unit flaps because you know it's, it was irrational and all that. And the reason why we have all these problems, we're basically rabbit earing this triangle, this this isosceles right triangle. And this isosceles right triangle has an irrational hypotenuse. You know how the hypotenuse is divided up? The basically half of the hypotenuse goes to this flap, half the hypotenuse goes to that flap. And if it's irrational, it means that both of these two flaps will have to be irrational. And that also causes our these side flaps to be irrational and the height to be irrational. Everything is irrational because the hypotenuse is irrational. So, what what triangles do we have that where the hypotenuse is is rational? It is not irrational. Well, I'm assuming you all know some basic high school math, but basically, um, we know for any right triangle, the hypotenuse C is going to be equal to the square root of the legs, the sum of the legs squared. And then we find um, that there's a few Pythagorean triangles, that's what they're called, where C is rational, C is not irrational. So the most common, the simplest one, is this three, four, five triangle. And then I guess the, another one, the next one that we might use would be five, 12, 13. So those are our, our basic Pythagorean triangles. So let's try this one. Let's try this three, four, five triangle and see what happens. So instead of making a instead of rabbit earring here on a fish base, let's try rabbit earring here. So to try this out, we're gonna think to take a four by four grid. 
So go ahead and grab a piece of kami, printer paper, whatever you want, any scrap paper, and go ahead and fold a uh, four by four grid on it. But okay, let's draw in our three by four, three, four, five triangle. It's actually super easy. Well, I'm actually gonna fold it in. We don't need to draw. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna fold this edge in. Don't really need this edge. And now we're gonna fold a diagonal from, just basically fold a diagonal. And this diagonal, is exactly five units long along the diagonal which is very very cool Something like this it doesn't really matter our mountain valley assignment All right you see this so here we have our triangle we have three four and you could use a ruler if you don't believe me just measure it and this is going to be five units long now let's grab it here. So basically, instead of making a fish base out of the square, like this, this is a fish base out of a square, we're going to make a fish base out of this rectangle here, this 3 by 4 rectangle. So let's do a bunch of angle bisectors. So we're going to bisect this angle by folding this edge to this edge. And then we'll also need this 90 degree thing. So let's make an angle bisector right like there. And then we can rabbit ear it all, basically. And flat, fold the flap both ways. So there's our rabbit ear. Now let's flip it over. And we're going to do some more bi angle bisector. So let's do an angle bisector to bring this edge to this edge. And then this, you know, this thing is kind of getting in the way, but ignore this little thing on the edge. Now let's angle bisect here. So this edge to that edge. And then this angle bisector. So this 90 degree thing. 45 degrees, you know, bisecting 90 degrees. And then here we go. So here is our... Pythagorean stretch. This is basically what a Pythagorean stretch is in its most simplest form. It's kind of like this fi this fish base, but instead of a fish base on a square, it's a fish base on a three by four rectangle. Okay. Now now let's let's look at what happened here. So we started off with the four by four grid, but now we have a thing that's five units long. Look at that, right? See how this this part this fish base part is stretching out longer than the edge of the square. So in normal box leading, that would not be possible. But with a Pythagorean stretch, it is. And now, now watch. Instead of having a flap that's a square root of two, like over here, this flap is exactly two units long. This flap is exactly one unit long. The river is exactly one unit long. This flap is one, and this flap is two. So all of our flaps are now at rational length. And not only that, but look at the altitude. The altitude here is one unit high, right? Axial plus one. The altitude over here is exactly uh, one unit high, you know, axial plus one. So everything is looking super nice here. Um, you can also unfold it and take a look at the slopes. So it's um, this is something you'll notice for um, for all Pythagorean triangles, which we're going to look at other cases later. But basically, the bisectors of a Pythagorean triangle form slopes, perfect slopes that lie on grid points. So here's a slope of negative one third. So kind of arc tan three kind of thing. Here's a slope of, you know, one half, depends how you rotate it. If you rotate it like this, it's a slope of two. If you rotate it like this, slope of half, you know, negative half. It doesn't really matter how you rotate it. It's basically arc tan two, arc tan three. And we're gonna talk more about that later. But basically the, the key thing you want to remember is that because the hypotenuse is rational. Yeah, that's basically why everything works out because the hypotenuse is rational. Now remember, remember back in our box pleating video, the intro, the fundamental box pleating video, we uh, kind of cut up the flap and stuff. I don't think I need to do that here, but I want you to see the hinges and stuff. So let me draw. The, let me just draw where all the flaps are. So here's this flap. Here's this flap.
Okay, I don't know how I can see that. But basically, we have our flap here. That's the two unit flap. There's our one unit flap, two unit flap, one unit flap, and the river going through. So what do you notice about our hypotenuse? It goes the straight, like directly from this top flap through the river and to this thing here, this bottom flap here. And so this is two units, one unit, two units, so that it makes use of the entire hypotenuse. And that's basically why everything works. All right, so now let's see, what are some ways that we can, you know, modify this Pythagorean stretch, use it for different contexts, etc. So probably the most, the most obvious way we can do it is we can sink it, or in other words, put it on a higher grid. So right now we have a four by four grid. Let's, let's divide, do some more divisions and make it an eight by eight grid. I'm gonna do that right now. Okay. So here we have an eight by eight grid and all of our diagonal precreases are still here. So I'm gonna go back and reset that Pythagorean stretch we had earlier. So go ahead and make our, remember it's kind of like a fish base, just go ahead and make that again. But now we're gonna do it on the on the eight by eight grid. So you know, like this little extra thing we can fold down here, we can sink these. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just going to, it's like sinking, sinking a fish base, right? You all know how to do this. So go ahead and fold it down and then sink. Open sink, right? There's one side. Same on the other side, so fold it down, sink it. You know the drill. Okay, so that that was pretty easy, right? Now now we have a slightly longer. It's kind of it feels longer right now instead of ten five unit hypotenuse. Now it's a ten unit hypotenuse. Everything kind of doubled in length and such. The last thing I want to talk about this video, remember this video is basically just to demystify Pythagorean stretches. Like before, it might have been like, yo, what, what is all this stuff going on? What is, what is Pythagoras? What is, what is all this stretch? What is a stretch, etc. Now you basically know, you know, it's like a fish base, but it's on a grid. It makes everything nice and rational and easy. The last thing um, you might not know is what are these little arm things? So basically, Pythagorean stretch, the way I think of it, for the simple cases, at least, you know, there's like a, a parallelogram, right, um, along the angle bisectors, and then there's these things that they might be official names, but I just call them arms because they kind of you know like they stick out. And what do they do? Well, what the arms do is they help you divide up how the hypotenuse is distributed. So in, right now we have it distributed. We have four units for this flap, four units for this flap, and two units for the river in the middle. But what if I want to distribute it so that this thing is five units long? And this one is like three units long and the river moves down or something. That's what the arms are here for. So um, we'll talk about more in the detail of how this works later. But basically you can try to, you can manipulate this stuff right now. So here I just did something with the arms just now. And now, now this thing is five units long. The river is one unit long. And you see the arm changed a little bit. Now the arm has kind of like a zigzag. It goes up and then out instead of just going straight out. We can do that again. Like this. And now, you know, it's even more different. Now there's no river. It's just a six unit long and four unit long, etc. And then this arm can also do, do stuff. So this arm, maybe I want to make, you know, one unit and three units. So that's basically, that's a rough um, oversimplification of what the arms can do. Yeah, so I think that's about it for this video. This video was was not very theoretical, not very rigorous. I just wanted to give an introduction to what Pythagorean stretches are, what basic example, and a few basic modifications we can do. But we don't really know, like, how do we use it in a model? Um, we kind of know how to make it. We don't know how does it fit in with the tree. Uh, how do we know exactly how to do this arm stuff? How do we know how big it is? What are um, other variations of it? Like, are we... Like, do we ha always have to have a hypot hypotenuse that runs from flap to flap? The answer is no, we don't actually have to do that. What's going on with the slopes here? What, what, what slopes work? How do we know when slopes work and don't work? Um, all that stuff we've got yet to cover. So we've got a long series ahead of us. Uh, so stay tuned for those. Stay tuned for the next videos. We're going to have a lot of nice stuff to talk about, okay? So make sure to subscribe so you don't miss those. Leave a like if this video helped because uh, it would help me also. And I will keep making these videos just for you. Alright, that's all for today. I will see you all later.